Let's begin with uh, paying homage to the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Okay, well this is a special, uh, special talk tonight, special occasion, last serious day of the retreat <laughs> is over now, tomorrow it's going to be a little bit different. Today was the last silent day, tomorrow will be a little bit of chit chatty and uh, but it's good, it's a good thing. Huh? Like the Buddha said, and everything that arises co also comes to an end. <laughs> so uh, we've done, uh, I think everybody here has done really, really, really good. I can just uh, say that for sure. It's been really beautiful to see you all meditate and get brighter and brighter every day. <laughs> That's always the joy. Um, so, since we have been talking quite deeply in the past three days, we've been taking this head-first dive into dependent origination, paticca samuppada, this breaking down the six sense bases and seeing how impermanent it is and deepening the wisdom of, of the Buddha. Um, it's been really interesting also uh, to see everyone's progress and see everyone's reaction to, uh, to the past few days, the deepening of the mind. So that's always really wonderful. And today, so I think, because I never really know what I'm going to talk about every day. So <laughs> it only uh, happens like a few hours before the talk, actually. Because I need to know where everybody is at the interviews and then I get a sense of what's going on and, you know, some people are here, some people are there, some people are over here. And then if I talk about this, then I have to kind of find a way to bridge over to these people. And, and I try to do that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> um, sometimes it works better than other times. Um, but tonight I felt like, um, actually, I had this sense that came that it would be really interesting to, after this, this whole retreat and this uh, really uh, kind of uh, dive deep into the, really the meditation and really wisdom and all of this, it would be really interesting to explore uh, one of the suttas that the Buddha gave 
very, very, very often that explains his whole path, basically. Because I haven't really been talking about the path, like the entire path. And I thought since tomorrow is the beginning of a new, uh, of a new leaf, turning over a new leaf, um, we're going to start uh, you know, talking a little bit. And um, by the way, it would, be, it would be nice if everybody could speak uh, maybe outside or if, if you could keep it down inside, basically, and try to go outside if you'd like to talk more. Because um, I know that uh, some people would definitely like to meditate. It's, it's an in-between tomorrow. So, and it, it's good that it's happening because it prepares everybody for the real going outside the walls <laughs> and going back to reality. Of course, there's going to be another talk tomorrow. But I thought tonight, um, because the thing is that for this kind of sutta to really have the, the best impact on someone, uh, like a time like this when the mind is very clear after almost 10 days of meditation, that's really uh, an excellent timing, I think. And this is one of the talks that the Buddha gave to, his, uh, to a lot of his uh, students or lay people that came to him, like hundreds of, hundreds of them which arose the vision of the Dhamma in them. <coughs> so I think it is quite appropriate tonight, and uh, it's called Samangapala Sutta. The, basically, the fruits of the meditative life, the contemplative life, the life of Samanas. Samanas, as you're probably familiar, at the time of the Buddha, there were two main movements, spiritual movements. There was the Samanas and the Brahmanas. Um, the, the Brahmins were, I think everybody's familiar <laughs> here, don't have to do a lot of explanation, so mainly a priestly caste who were, like, you know, they had fields, they had cattle, they had many things, they knew the Vedas, and uh, yeah, I think you probably actually know more than me. <laughs> And the Samanas, the Shramanas, basically, who left everything behind. And they had no ties with any of the past, like, household life. And they would just, like, start wandering about and just practice in the forest and leave everything. And so the... Uh-huh. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So this king Ajatasattu, basically, who was uh, the king of Magadha, is it? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then, um, pretty, pretty uh, bad king. I mean, uh, he executed his father, who was a very dhammic person, uh, just to take the throne from him. So. Um, went to the Buddha and uh, basically asked him, like, you know, what's, what's, like, what's the purpose of what you're doing? Like, what, what are the fruits of, you know, doing what you're doing? And that's actually something that we come up a lot uh, as meditators. Um, I don't, well, I don't know. I don't know here, but in the West, definitely, it's uh, in the back of people's mind a lot. Like, you meditate, like, you just take your time for yourself, and you're just being selfish, basically. <laughs> and so, it's, um, it's really a perspective uh, in the West. I'm not sure here, but uh, sometimes, you know, like, uh, it's seen as, like, um, not really uh, taking your responsibilities, uh, being uh, kind of careless about others and things like that. But it's, uh, that's a very... Uh, kind of really not understanding very well what we're doing here. So I was fumbling around in my teaching material and I just uh, stumbled upon this, this short poem, which uh, I thought was really interesting. And it talks about what a poet is, actually. <laughs> and it says, a poet is someone who can pour light into a cup, then raise it to nourish your beautiful, parched, holy mouth. <laughs> and 
when I read this, I thought, wow, this is the Buddha. <laughs> um, the poet of Dhamma, the, the king of Dhamma. Um, and I think this is what this sutta is famous for because people listened to it and they remembered the light of wisdom, the light of the Buddha's wisdom, basically. That somehow, a lot of us, when we hear that, uh, this breaking down of the whole path, it really strikes a chord within us. And it, it's like remembering that, yeah, this is, this is right, like this is the way. <laughs> and so I read that and I know it's, it's got nothing to do really with uh, <laughs> talking about poets. And, um, but I really thought this, this was really fitting for the Buddha actually, who's just giving us the light of his wisdom in a glass for us to drink. And for me, I was parched definitely for years. I was looking for meaning in my life. I was looking for uh, truth. And when I came upon his words, then uh, it was definitely like uh, drinking for the first time. So, and also I didn't have a poem prepared for you tonight, so I didn't want to leave you without a poem. <laughs> yes. Mm. Oh. Uh oh. <laughs> um, where is it? A poet is someone who can pour light into a cup, then raise it to nourish your beautiful parched holy mouth. And I think also the Buddha is really good at rem like making us remember how holy we can act or how well we can do our inner holiness basically his path is so beautiful and clear and bright and when we just hear it it just makes so much sense and it's like remembering and in fact this is how a lot of sutta ends it's like people remembering like oh it's like setting up something that was knocked down setting up straight something that was knocked down like remember something that you'd forgotten, like showing the path to someone who was lost. And these suttas actually really often end in that way. And then people go for refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. And so yes, so when I read that, I read that, um, it really, yeah, it really reminded me of the Buddha. And this will tie into, um, I will read the, the Fruits of the Truth Seeking Life. And this is from uh, my book, Bhavana, basically. This is the first part of it, is basically just the sutta with a few notes. Yes. Sorry. So, yes, I'm sorry. Um, as, you, as I said, I'm, I never, like, I don't prepare these talks. So, when I start, it's like building momentum. <laughs> so I don't really think about <laughs> I'm just kind of chaining up ideas in my mind <laughs> and formulating the, the introduction how it's gonna go because I don't know so um, but anyways this and this introduction will make you know the poem will make a lot more sense when you hear the sutta and when you hear I'll, I'll be speaking I'll be introducing also a little addition just to, uh, to explain to you how the, uh, how the, the vision of the Dhamma basically arose, because it's not very uh, often in the suttas, it's more in the Vinaya. So I'll just do a little remix here. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then you can actually get a lot more of the puzzle than people usually get, actually. So, um, and you will understand as I'm reading why I started with this uh, poem. So one of the problems with uh, this particular uh, sutta, this is number two in the long discourses, the Di Ganakaya. And one of the problems with it is that it's got like, I don't know, like a 15 page introduction. <laughs> so before you get to the actual path. And so, you know, a lot of people, they read it and it's just really heady and it talks about King Ajatasattu, it's the full moon night, it's the Upasata, and it's Observance Day. 
and he's like all with all of his ministers on top of his castle and he's like oh what a beautiful full moon night and uh, it's got this long introduction about um, he wants to see a spiritual master and then all of his ministers suggest him oh well there's this one and then there's this one and then there's and they explain all of their teachings and it takes like forever and uh, <laughs> and then um, and then one of them says, well, the Buddha is residing in my mango grove. You can come and visit him anytime. And so he just goes like, yeah, sure, this one, I'll try. Because he's tried all the other ones and he's just like, meh. Um, I've heard everything that they had to say and I'm not that impressed. Because he's going to say that later too. And so he says, uh, okay, harness the hundred elephants and... Like, uh, let's all go with all my concerts. And uh, yeah, so this is how it begins. But this is a summary. <laughs> so he goes to the monastery. Um, and from there, um, it's really quiet. And he's really impressed that all the monks are just sitting there. There's not a sound. And because uh, at that time, usually it would be like debating about ideas and stuff like that. And all the monks are just like sitting quiet. And the Buddha, he doesn't even know where the Buddha is. He's asking his attendant. And he's just like, yeah, it's him over there. And then so he goes to him. And this is how it starts, basically. Okay. So there's the king addressing the Buddha now. Dear Bhante, there are various professions and crafts, such as chefs, barbers, and soap makers, cooks, gardeners, and dyers, weavers, reed workers, and potters, translators, and accountants, and all those with similar professions and skills, they live by the visible fruits of their profession. They themselves happily enjoy this, their mothers and fathers happily enjoy this, their children and wife happily enjoy this, their friends and relatives happily enjoy this. So this is the kind of thought that comes to us a lot. Uh, monks who have left everything behind. A lot of people say this kind of questions. So, they can thereby support the spiritual life and offer to wandering seekers and Brahmins. They stand in what is divine, in what has a happy result, in what is conducive to the celestial abodes. Bhante, is it possible to reveal any visible fruit of the truth-seeking life, of the meditative meditative life. It is possible, great king, listen carefully and apply your mind to what I say. Yes, Bhante, replied the king. Great king, a truth finder arises in the world, an arahant, perfectly all awakened, endowed with righteous knowledge and righteous behavior. The Buddha was known to practice what he taught. So he was not saying one thing and doing another. He was saying one thing and doing it. <laughs> so a blissful one, knower of the worlds, unsurpassed guide for those who seek peace, teacher of devas and humans, awakened and exalted. He teaches the Dhamma, which is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the, in, in the ending. In the meaning and the phrasing, he embodies and shines forth the completely perfected and utterly pure spiritual life. Then this Dhamma is heard by someone reborn in any family or country. And this is really interesting because this is still happening even though he's not here. <laughs> And this is where I'm digressing a little bit and giving you a little bit of a side, side dish here from uh, the wonderful qualities of Ugga. And this is a book of eight in the Anguttara Nikaya. Ugga was one of the lay anagamis, um, a follower of the Buddha, very advanced meditator. I'm just giving you a very brief slice of it because this is how he saw the Buddha. This is how the Dhamma Chakku, the vision of the Dhamma, arose for him. So this is like a testimonial kind of thing. It's like a side note. The moment I first laid eyes upon the awakened one from a distance, understanding immediately came to me. 
And my mind became clear and confident in him just by seeing him. This is the first unusual and striking thing which one could say about me. Then Bhante, with a confident mind, I offered him all of my attention, and he delivered a gradual discourse, that is, a talk on generosity, a talk on performing harmless actions, a talk on the blissful spheres of existence, and that includes meditation. He made clear the wretchedness, depravity, and defilement of seeking happiness in sensory indulgence and the advantage of giving it up. When he saw that my mind was ready, malleable, unobstructed, joyful, and bright, he delivered the exalted teaching of the Buddhas, that is, trouble, how it arises, how it ceases, and the path. As a clean cloth rid of dirt would accept thy perfectly in the same way, sitting there, the stainless, spotless vision of the Dhamma came to me. I realized that which is of a nature to begin, all of it is also of a nature to end. Then Bhante, having seen the Dhamma, attained the Dhamma, experienced the Dhamma, thoroughly plunged and entered the Dhamma, crushed uncertainty, having gotten rid of skepticism, reached perfect confidence in the teacher's teaching. Right then, I went to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha as a refuge, and I undertook the five trainings in virtue of the righteous life. This is the second unusual and perhaps striking thing which one could say about me. So, and this is Uga's personal testimony, but uh, this is very uh, typical. It will be pretty much the same formula that is used, basically, and more or less the same wording. Sometimes they would add uh, who's reached uh, perfect confidence in the teaching without, uh, without another's help, basically. At that point, when somebody understands the Dhamma, they understand the Dhamma. They don't need somebody else to say whatever this or that, or say like, oh, what you know is not right. It doesn't change anything. When you know the Dhamma to a certain depth, then whatever people will say doesn't matter. So their understanding is unshakable. So the gradual talk that the Buddha gave to Uga, this is what I'm giving you tonight. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. And so now I'm back to the Diganikaya 2, Samanyapada Sutta. Having now heard this Dhamma of the Buddha, basically, that person acquires faith in the Buddha. Then one under, uh, undertakes the training. Basically, there's a little sentence here which says uh, the holy... Uh, the household life is crowded and dusty, the life gone forth is pure and bright, let me leave everything behind, and then they would take the training, basically. But that can be anybody, you don't have to become a monk, really. That's really up to anybody. Then one lives self-mastered and protected by the Patimokkha. This is all the monastic rules, but this, basically, we're talking about virtue now. Sila, Samadhi, Panya. And this is Sila here. Continually living in righteous behavior, seeing danger in the smallest lapse of attention, undertaking the training in virtues, skillfully conducted in physical and verbal actions, completely pure in living and good in nature, watchful over the doors of one's sense faculties, possessed of presence and full awareness, happy and content. So in this version, I change monk for seeker so that it's more general. So uh, when I say seeker, then it just means like whoever is starting this practice. And how is a seeker good in nature? One abandons hurting living beings. One turns away from hurting living beings with neither stick nor sword. One lives considerate and kind, 
friendly and compassionate towards all living beings. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons the taking of what is not given. One turns away from taking what is not given, taking only what is offered, expecting only what is offered. One lives without stealing with inner purity. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons sexual misbehavior, one lives content and at peace, not obsessed by physical attraction. Of course, this is leaning towards monastic life. There's a right way of doing this. This constitutes one's good nature. But for monks, it's just... <laughs> one abandons speaking lies, one turns away from speaking lies. One is known to be to speak the truth, filled with the truth, firm and trustworthy. Not a deceiver of the world. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons hurtful speech. One turns away from hurtful speech. One does not repeat elsewhere what one has heard here in order to divide the people here. One does not repeat here what one has heard elsewhere in order to divide the people elsewhere. One is a unifier of those who are divided, a promoter of those who are united. One enjoys harmony, delights in harmony, rejoices in harmony. One speaks praise of making peace and harmony. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons coarse speech. One turns away from coarse speech, speaking with words that are polished, pleasant to ear, loving, going to the heart and civilized, beloved and dear to many. Such are the words that one speaks. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons meaningless talk. One turns away from meaningless talk. One is a speaker of words that are timely, factual, and meaningful. A speaker of Dhamma, a speaker of Vinaya. One speaks for the purpose of laying down the burden. Words that are appropriate, reasoned, well-defined, in connection with the meaning. This constitutes one's good nature. One turns away from injuring the seed kingdom and the plant kingdom. This is more monastic. Uh, there's a f you know, but it's still inspiring to hear, I think. <laughs> one is a one meal eater, not eating in the evening. One turns away from eating at improper times. And now here is another it's a strength and a weakness of this sutta. It just goes on and on and on and on on virtue. It's a really, really, really long section on virtue here, and I'm just abridging it completely here. I just told you the short uh, section on virtue, then there's the medium, and then there's the long. So you just get a sense of that. Yeah. <laughs> We're just going to go right away into <laughs> the next portion. That's why, that's why it's, um, that, that's a sutta I wanted my community to have right from the beginning because I think that's the sutta when it's heard, you know, when you cut the intro and then when you cut a little bit of the virtue, it makes it a little bit more digestible and, it's <laughs> and it just really goes to the core and it's so beautiful and that's why I wanted to offer my community this like kind of first step and in this book, Bhavana, it, that's how it's organized. So it's basically really accessible. You don't, you don't have to read the whole thing and then like really try to understand what's really meaningful. And here you kind of really get to the core of it so you can have the, the real uh, important parts. <laughs> so remember, he's, uh, he's explaining, so what's the purpose of this meditation that we're doing here? And this is now getting, starting to get interesting because he's talking about uh, a real kind of happiness that really derives from this, even the virtues. In this way, great king, for a seeker of good, na of good nature, 
there is no fear arising from anywhere, since one is protected by their own virtues. Just as for a highly celebrated king of the Katiya caste, who has conquered his enemies in the four directions, there is no fear arising from anywhere, and he lives protected by his conquest. In the same way, for the good-natured seeker, there is no fear arising from anywhere, because one is protected by one's own good virtue. Following this entire body of awakened virtuous behavior, the virtuous behaviors of the Aryas, basically, one experiences within oneself a completely blameless happiness. And in another sutta, the Buddha says that this monks, this virtue, is your beauty, basically. This is, and this is everybody's beauty. It's, it's not just the monk's beauty, but you know, we can't wear ornaments, we can't put perfumes and scents and all of that stuff. We just let it all go, but our beauty is our virtue. And this is what really shines in the world. And this is the same thing for everybody, really. In this way, great king, a seeker is of good nature. Now we begin the training in meditation. And that is, what is the first step of samadhi? Samadhi. It starts with right. <laughs> And then with, yes, yes, there we go. Just wise practice, right effort. Good, very good. And the first fold of uh, wise practice or right effort is about protecting, protecting, yeah. Guarding. How is a seeker a gatekeeper of one's sense faculties? This is Indriya Sangvara, basically, in Pali. And actually today there was a really good question. Uh, somebody asked, um, so do you think that if the Buddha was living in this time, there would be a ninth fold of the path, which would be like right social media? <laughs> that was a great question. And um, it actually falls into this section, basically. It's just like, because there's... There's also, you know, there's, there's abandoning the unwholesome, cultivating the wholesome. So that would be like kind of picking what you're actually following or who you're following or whatever you're doing or subscribing to. And then, so that's going to come back at you. And then there's also, you know, like there's also things that you just want to avoid, basically. You just want to like, I'll just leave that one out. <laughs> Unless you're um, actually a, a, like, a, and then the, that would be like called like a right social media, like some, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, a uh, funny fact, uh, in Sri Lanka, there's a TV, it's called Samma TV. So, <laughs> so if, you, if you speak Singhala, you can tap into the ninth fold of the path. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's already, it already exists. <laughs> So yes, so now is uh, protecting, basically protecting our minds. That's the first thing, or guarding our minds. Just because if we don't guard our minds, mind just goes everywhere and, and everything. So there's a little bit of that involved. Seeing a shape with the eye, one does not dwell on it with one's mind, nor does one dwell on any of its features. If one were to live with a visual faculty unprotected, longing and patience and unskillful unwholesome states would take over one's mind. Thus one practices for its mastery. One protects the visual faculty. One becomes skilled regarding the visual faculty. And the first part, this first part is actually going to really help us maintaining. A lot of people ask, but how do I maintain this in day-to-day -day life? Well, part of it is just being skillful in how we engage in the senses, basically. It's, um, usually it's, it's called refraining and restraining, and these words are being used, but 
it's a little, uh, I found it wasn't really welcomed in <laughs> where I'm from anyways. So, uh, and I find that uh, protecting, and actually the word uh, raksha comes back uh, a few times in the, in the sutta also. So it's, um, it, it talks about that, just like, yeah, we can see it as restraining the mind and things like that, but it feels forced and protecting feels a lot more caring, <laughs> loving, kind. So yeah, just being kind to your own mind. Yeah, there's that. And then there's, it's just basically knowing that whatever happens at any of the sense doors, and that ties in into a lot of the wisdom we've talked about, is just to know that if you were to really like engage in that, then that's when problems can occur, basically. Because then you can get attached, and then when that object is ripped away from you, then you become angry, impatient. But if you, if you just know not to go into these things, like you're still doing whatever you need to do, and that's not the point. But you know that you're protecting your senses. You know that it's just senses, basically. And you're basically at each door of the senses, you're protecting your mind, basically because all these senses end up in the mind. And if they're not protected, then mind either goes out or it's being assailed by <laughs> anything. Mm -hmm. Hearing a sound with the ear, smelling an odor with the nose. Does it sound familiar? <laughs> Tasting a flavor with the tongue. Touching a tangible with the body and aware of a mental state or mental object with the mind. One does not dwell on it with one's mind, nor does one dwell on any of its features. See, it just, it, it's there, and we, need, we do what we need to do, but that's it, we're just protecting the mind. If one were to live with the mind faculty unprotected, then longing and patience and unskillful, unwholesome states would take over one's mind. Then, thus, one practices for its mastery. One protects the mental faculty. One becomes skilled regarding the mental faculty. Possessing this self-mastery of the awakened ones, one experiences within oneself a happiness that is completely blameless. And this is also really important, and this is beautiful, because a lot of the time when we use the word restraint and refrain and all of that, it's like we have a hard time associating it with happiness. But it's true that when we actually protect and guard each of the sense bases, actually we're able to contain you know, this, this beautiful spring of happiness that so many of you have been tapping into uh, during this retreat. Actually, we're able to keep it like uh, a lot better so so this happiness is completely blameless there's nobody like you're not hurting anybody doing this you're not taking anything from anybody else actually you're protecting everybody at the same time so this is how a seeker is a gatekeeper of one's own sense faculties now presence and full awareness how is a seeker present and fully aware? One is fully conscious while going forward and coming back. One is fully conscious looking ahead and looking down. One is fully conscious moving and extending one's body. One is fully conscious putting on the outer robe, your t-shirt or whatever it is <laughs> happens to be, your, your jacket, you know, whatever one's bowl and one's robe, mm. grabbing the dishes, you know, same thing. <laughs> and um, I'm just curious because this is interpreted in a lot of different ways. And how do you think one is fully present and conscious? How does that come to be? Is, is, is it Is that, is that what that means? No, because I think, you know, I've heard this before a lot of times. You have, 
be aware of, you, you know? Communication? Yeah, that's getting close. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just watching the mic, how they react. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's six of them. <laughs> <laughs> the six R's, yeah. Uh, you make basically the, the way that we're aware and present is when there's no hindrance in the mind. When there's no hindrance in the mind, we're here. There's, that's it. That's, that's all it is. And if there's a hindrance in the mind, then we're not that present. It's like awareness of the body, like the first satipatthana. We're always aware of body. I mean, this is, this is it. Like, we're in it. <laughs> Sorry. We're stuck with it. <laughs> Even if you didn't want it to be there, it's going to be there. It's actually when we stop doing everything else that we become aware of body. When there's no hindrance, when you're not thinking, when you're not proliferating, propagating, papancha, restlessness, worry, agitation, jealousy, wanting, hatred. You remember the 16? Yes. <laughs> but when that's not there, the Buddha says the mind is clear. The mind is present. Sati sampajanya. Like you're here, fully conscious. You don't, because for me, I thought for many years that it meant like, like this. But this is actually really hard to maintain. And it's, uh, it, the more you do it, the more it's, it, it gets tensed and it gets painful, really. Um, and then you just accumulate this tension all the time. Done that for five years. And uh, yeah, and then it requires a lot of energy. Whereas what we're doing, it's actually freeing the mind. It's giving lots of room, lots of space, lots of energy to the mind because it's free. When craving, when the hindrances are gone, then there's beautiful, calm energy. There's awareness, clear awareness. And this becomes effortless, basically. He's basically saying, stop thinking about everything else and just be here. <laughs> That's it. Tomorrow, Yes, yes. So, once we are going straight for the Dhamma, uh -huh. uh, how do you explain a bunch of people like this? What should be six hours and what should be the right thing to support? Uh -huh. In what situation? Uh, like we are going to the riding hall oh, okay. tomorrow, especially yes. because uh -huh. tomorrow it's like everybody is going to be talking. Uh -huh. So, when you are going there, I am just giving you a situation. Yes, yes. But the situation can be like, So basically, just make sure there's wholesome states in your mind. Basically, that's all it is. And then you'll be maintaining your awareness. That's why we praise Metta and the Brahma Viharas so much, is because when you do it, you ha there's awareness. And then, and then whatever comes and knock you off from that, six R, and then continue. And if... Um, because the Metta is such a... Um, it's like a, a lifeline, a buoy, or whatever you want to call it. It's like whenever you're going to call upon it, it's going to be there. It's going to buoy you up. It's going to float you up, basically. And it's, it's going to give your mind something to hold on to. If, if, there's, you know, if there's a question arising, if you're wondering, am I mindful? Am I not? And it's all about learning to see is the mind wholesome? Is the mind loving and kind and patient and accepting, welcoming? Or is the mind restless? Is the mind worried, thinking about something? And then uh, there's a certain, you know, and, and especially in day-to-day -day life, there's going to be a lot of gray. 
like <laughs> I, um, 50 shades is not enough <laughs> there's gonna be a probably a bazillion shades of gray yes <laughs> but th really what you want to hold on to is the template wholesome wholesome mind will have awareness in it yes and then if you feel it becoming tensed awareness of the body is amazing it is like a miracle it's like you don't need to start thinking about anything if you feel tension in your body you can just go right there and six are it, relax it, smile. And then, you know, that's, that's what I do a lot. Uh, when there's a lot of things going on, you just learn to be really close to your body and you'll know right away when there's tension arising. When there's tension, you know that, yeah, relax. Uh, when I go for alms and I'm thinking, then I'm noticing my pace is faster. And then I'm, I'm noticing, oh, hey, I'm, th I'm, I'm thinking. And there's actually a little bit of tension, like like whole nervous system tension, basically. It manifests all over the place. Then I usually actually stop walking. I stop walking, and then I calm down. And it's not like I'm really agitated. I'm, go I'm going for alms. Like <laughs> but sometimes, you know, mind is a little active. So, And when, when that happens... I just like, I stop, full stop. And I just enjoy the relief, basically, just for a few seconds. And that's a huge game changer. Mm -hmm. It brings you right back to presence of mind. Mm -hmm. So, and of course the six R's and the whole path you've been practicing is obviously, I mean, that's the right answer too, so. Okay, okay. One is, oh, yes, 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 yes. And you can also develop that sense that metta is actually your island. It's your safety. And when you let go everything, you can do that. Like you can just like let go of everything else and find refuge in the metta. And you'll just drop into it and everything else is just going to go with it too. And that's really helpful. When you learn to really do that properly, it's really a good... Uh, reset <laughs> so yeah it's actually one of the 11 qualities of metta metta nisamsa it's uh, you're untouchable basically <laughs> you know, but nothing can hurt you <laughs> so so that means like yeah like all the yakas and all that but also all the not good thinking so <laughs> one is fully conscious while eating drinking chewing and swallowing one is fully conscious while evacuating and urinating. One is fully conscious while walking, standing, sitting, sleeping, and waking up, talking, and keeping silent. <laughs> you try that, it's pretty hard. <laughs> sleep, sleeping, going, going to sleep. Yes, uh, yeah, sleeping or going to sleep, depending. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty hard, yeah. <laughs> you can, but uh, it's a life practice, I think. <laughs> Lifetime practice. This is how a seeker is present and fully aware. How is a seeker content? One is happy with robes to cover one's body with alms food to satisfy one's stomach. So, so you're not making such a big deal about, you know, what you're wearing, what you're eating. Yeah, you do what, what you need to eat, what you need to wear, but keeping that on the light side will help your mind a lot. Wherever one goes, one sets out taking only these things. Just as birds, wherever they fly, take nothing but their wings and fly with themselves as only burden. In the same way, one is happy with robes to cover one's body, with alms food to satisfy one's stomach. And where, wherever one goes, one sets out taking only these things. This is how, great king, a seeker is content. So this is easily easier said than done. Um, I came from Sri Lanka with this bag. And um, when I arrived here, they gave me 
all of Delson's book to carry in the luggage. I mean, an old guy. <laughs> so I was carrying this huge thing around. And the guy, the <laughs> my poor rickshaw driver, <laughs> he tried to pick it up and the handle ripped. Because <laughs> it was so heavy. <laughs> it's this massive thing, <laughs> just like. So. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, so it's it's like a really good theory, but even when you're a monk, see what happens. <laughs> they give me all these copies of dependent origination and all these pens to bring here because they wanted you know, people to have things to write on and things like that. Which, I mean, it was great, but it's funny. I just thought I would plug it in. <laughs> Poor guy, he's just trying to pick it up. <coughs> Feeling so bad that he broke my luggage. <laughs> I just laughed and I just tapped on his shoulder. <laughs> mm. So there's a lot of love in the books you received. <laughs> Following, and now there's a little summary here. Following the entire body of good conduct of the awakened ones, possessing the awakened ones' mastery of the sense faculties, endowed with the awakened ones' presence and full awareness, attain to this contentment of the awakened ones, the Aryas. One resorts to a secluded dwelling to the forest at the root of a tree on a hillside in some caves, a refuge in the mountain, a forest hut, in the open air, on a pile of straw, in Jedvan Monastery, on retreat. <laughs> Same thing. After having eaten, returning from alms round, one sits down with legs folded and one's body upright, settling down one attends with presence about oneself can be in a chair too, no problem. Uh, Bhante would say, there is no magic in the floor. And it's true, there's not. <laughs> okay. Now the Buddha doesn't launch into any really kind of complicated meditation instructions. He just goes through like you need to abandon the hindrances basically. First you protect you be content, you be, uh, um, what did I say, present and fully conscious, that will help. This is the first right effort, basically, that will help you protect what you cultivate. And if you don't protect what you cultivate, you just lose it right away. So, and now we're talking about abandoning the hindrances. So this is the abandoning part, the second fold of the wise practice. Abandoning longing for the world, dwelling and now, what is the world for the Buddha? The six, the six senses. Yeah, this is one of the places. Where, that's exactly what that means. The world, just the six senses. People think like, oh, it's so like, just leave the world. Yeah, but it's actually what we just talked about, the six senses. Dwelling with a mind void of longing, one's mind is cleansed from longing. Abandoning hostility and hatred, one dwells with a mind rid of hostility, with a heartfelt compassion towards all living beings. One's mind is cleansed from hostility and hatred, leaving behind laziness and dullness of mind, dwelling with a mind void of lazy dullness, perceiving clearly, present and fully aware. One's mind is cleansed from dull, dull laziness, Leaving behind agitation and worry, one dwells uplifted with an inwardly relieved mind. One's mind is cleansed from agitation and worry. Leaving behind perplexity or doubt, one dwells unperplexed, rid of uncertainty towards what is good. One's mind is cleansed from perplexity. And how do we do this? Does that sound like uh, something familiar? Six R's? Yeah, this is it. It's just, he's, he's not saying the six R's, but this is really what it means. This is like everything that could ever arise in your mind. It's 
pretty close to all of this. So just six hours, yeah. And then we're gonna get into the wholesome states too. But, uh, and again, there's many ways of practicing that. And then there's many ways also of developing wholesome states. We're not gonna cover all of this, but this is a, a very general path that the Buddha gave, which is just really beautiful and simple. Just as if someone was in debt, sick, imprisoned in servitude on a wild desert journey. This is how a seeker perceives carrying around the five hindrances within oneself. See, the more and more we will deepen our wisdom and we will see, I'm not happy when I'm angry. I'm not happy when I'm worried. And it's not benefiting anybody around me. I'm not happy when uh, I'm restless. I'm not happy when I'm just always wanting something. And that's also affecting everybody around us. And this is the four, first noble truth and the second noble truth also. But just as if one were freed from debt, freed from illness, freed, freed from jail, freed from slavery, having come upon a heaven on this world, on this earth, this is how a seeker perceives the letting go of the five hindrances within oneself. And here's a little addition from my part. Uh, this is part of the book, but it's uh, just briefly talking about the metta practice because this is where we would start doing that, basically. Then the virtuous seeker, void of longing, void of impatience, void of arrogance, just what we've just talked about, fully conscious and continually present, meditates with a heart filled with love, suffusing one direction, a second, a third, and a fourth above, below, and everywhere across, to all living beings in this boundless universe. One meditates with a heart filled with love, vast, expansive, measureless, free from anger and impatience. Imagine a mighty conch blower. You know what a conch blower is? Conch. 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 In English, I think we say conch. 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 Conch, yeah, <laughs> conch. I'll say conch, here's the Hindi version. Uh, okay, so I'll skip over the world. Yeah, the shell blower. Like uh, Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> okay. Imagine a mighty conch or conch blower who could effortlessly let his sound be known to the four directions. In the same way, when the release of mind by boundless love, metta ceto vimutti, is developed and cultivated, if any selfish mental state or desiring was previously acquired, none can settle there, none can stay. Isn't that beautiful? This is why I always talk about metta as the, the cleaning agent. <laughs> this is where I take it from. This is in the Sankadamma Sutta. When you're fully devoted to metta, that's what happens. If there's metta, the unwholesome state, states cannot stay unless you leave the metta. But if there is metta and you're fully devoted to it, that's it. That's all you need to do. Growing increasingly aware, now the samadhi born of happiness. Rings a bell? Growing increasingly aware of this gradual fading away of these five hindrances within oneself, relief arises. And the relief here is pamoja, which we've seen with the similes earlier is quite striking. It's from the gladness or from the relief, Joy arises in the mind. With a joyful mind, the body becomes calm. With a calm body, one experiences happiness or ease. With, ha with a happy mind comes samadhi. Sukino chittang samadhi atti. I just love to repeat that one over and over again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And now, in the actual text here, there's no 
point. There's no punctuation. It just goes right into the first jhana. So this is all together. And the first jhana is not a clear distinction here. Rather, it is just a flowing of these seven supports of awakening, just starting to agglomerate and making sense and the momentum arises. Now we can experience this. Letting go of all outward desires, letting go of unwholesome mental states, still attended by thinking and imagining. See here, there's still the, some activity. With the blissful happiness born of letting go, one understands and abides in the first level of meditation. And this is what I've been emphasizing today at the interviews is that a lot of people now on this retreat have been going deeper in their meditation and a lot have been experiencing something we call the still mind, the exquisite stillness like Bhante would call it, or the clear mind. And it's important to remember that sequence and to remember that the Brahma Viharas are actually what is bringing us there. Because one thing that happens when we start sitting for very long and with the still mind is that we forget that because we get so used to the still mind, basically. And then sometimes we can, um, we sit so long that the mind can start to like, um, like we'll go for walking meditation, for example, and then, then come back down. And then we're so kind of used to like being like uh, in the still mind that um, the mind will just want to like, take a hold of it again basically and kind of make it happen but then what happens is that oh, it's kind of like slipping and then it just falls <laughs> and then meditation gets a little dry and then and then there's like uh, thoughts arising and people are like but what's going on like I'm, I'm just with the still mind like I haven't changed anything and it's true but sometimes it's, it's because it's so subtle that we forget that actually it's the joy that got us there, the metta, the Brahma Viharas. And this is what we're doing. This is how it's starting. We're starting with abandoning like the six Rs, abandoning unwholesome states and making a big foundation and then working with metta and then it's cleansing and cleansing, then moving into the Brahma Viharas, moving up in the jhanas. And slowly we can actually uphold the still mind and it has a, a good stand basically to stand on because we cannot force it. It's just not something that we can force. It's something that we can uphold by true knowledge and wisdom. So, and anytime we start to try to like over-focus on it kind of thing, we don't even try. It just, sometimes it just happens because awareness slips a little bit and we try to hold on to it. Um, so we, it's just remembering to relax and have fun and it will just go back, right back to it. As soon as you just let go of everything and you just smile and you just, ha, just laugh at the mind a little bit. <laughs> so this is what happens. And so that's why we encourage uh, everybody who has been practicing uh, on the retreat to whenever you go back out or whenever we, we're in the retreat, often we'll say even to advanced meditator, yeah, just start with a little bit of metta anyways and just let it flow through all of the Brahma Viharas. It, it can be very quick and it can flow right back into still mind, but it's good to always start there. And then you make sure that you have the right stand for the higher collectedness of mind that is the still mind. So, and that will just happen effortlessly, basically. So when you're outside also of the retreat, that's a really good trick to have. Remember, start with the metta, clean the slate, and then you'll see it will fly right back in. And now this is uh, my favorite part. <laughs> the Buddha actually, and this is where, um, when I first was uh, practicing another kind of meditation and I, I uh, found the suttas and I, I read this particular sutta and for me it was life-changing, obviously. <laughs> and um, I, I read the sutta and I was like, what is he talking about? <laughs> I am not experiencing that. <laughs> but it's so amazing. And if you practice properly, like in this particular way, this is possible, like this is what a lot of people are experiencing here. And when you read the suttas, then it makes sense. It makes total sense. 
And here we are, and this is after the explanation of the first jhana, basically, the first level of meditation. And that's basically his meditation instructions, just so you know. <laughs> One immerses, permeates, suffuses, and pervades one's body with this blissful happiness born of letting go. And nowhere in one's entire body is left untouched by this blissful happiness born of letting go. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. And actually, we don't talk about it in these terms, but a lot of people will. Uh, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for joy arising in people. And that's the first thing that we're looking for, that you actually have to feel this. Imagine a skilled soap maker. Did you want to? And then he comes up with this, these beautiful similes, these beautiful analogies to even like further his uh, teaching. And this is really how the Buddha taught. Like he had these amazing analogies, which makes it so human and alive and applicable. Imagine a skilled soap maker. And at that time, they, um, that's actually a, a duty of the monks towards their preceptor. We have to make their toiletries, basically. <laughs> in the morning for so that when they go to the bathroom or whatever they need we have to like the the younger monks will have to take care of that for the senior monks and at that time they made the soap with like chunang and uh, like these powders and herbs and they would like kind of uh, uh, how do you say it knead it knead it like this and they would make a kind of a soap and then they would go into uh, the jantagari which is uh, like basically a sauna yeah, it was a very different uh, way of doing things. <laughs> but um, in my monastery in Sri Lanka, we do have a, a sauna like this, like exactly how they used to do it. And uh, the monks are just like, anyways. So it's, it's funny because it's really like, uh, oh, wow, this is <laughs> reading the text and having it there. So imagine a skilled soap maker who would throw some soap powder into a copper bowl he would sprinkle it with water and knead it thoroughly. Then after some time, the lump of soap would be filled and suffused by moisture through and through, everywhere touched by the moisture, yet it would not leak. So I like to understand this as just filling the whole body. And sometimes it's something that I say, actually in guided meditations I've done in the past is like filling your whole body with love, basically. And because you want to feel it for yourself first and then, and then you can share it. But the not leaking is really interesting because I think it's just like this, like the mind is just in the body. The mind is just suffusing the body with that joy, but it's not leaking out. It's not actually asavas it's not flowing to all of these things in the world so do you want to okay oh, okay okay in the same way one immerses permeates suffuses and pervades one's body with this blissful happiness born of letting go and nowhere in one's entire body is left untouched by this blissful happiness born of letting go viveka Viveka jang piti sukkang. This is a visible fruit of the truth-seeking life, of the meditation life, meditative life, beyond and more exalted than all previous ones. So now he's starting to answer the king quite squarely. <laughs> so you can go. Okay? Okay. Okay. With the calming of thinking and reflection, with inner tranquilization, one's mind becoming unified. And this is the first mention of samadhi, by the way. And the first we have vitaka vichara. So samadhi cannot really be, you know, uh, uh, fully grasped yet. If, and there's kind of a sense that things are coming together, but second jhana usually is the confidence and the collectedness is coming into being more without thinking and reflection, with the blissful happiness born of mental harmony, of samadhi. So this is samadhi jang piti sukkang. 
one understands and dwells in the second level of meditation. Now the instructions, one immerses, permeates, suffuses and pervades one's body with this blissful happiness born of mental harmony or samadhi, collectiveness. And this is very palpable, like this is very uh, tangible, this blissful uh, experience of the mind starting to collect here is just really good, it's very blissful. And nowhere in one's entire body is left untouched by this blissful happiness born of mental collectedness. Okay. Imagine a deep lake with water only welling up from within, so there's a source under the, water, the lake. With no other source flowing in from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south, with no proper rain at any time. So this only source at the bottom of that lake that's feeding the lake. From that cool water spring gushing up from within, that lake would become immersed, permeated, suffused and pervaded by this fresh and cool water. So you get a sense of how that could feel. And nowhere in this entire lake would be left untouched by this cool spring water. In the same way, one immerses, permeates, suffuses, and pervades one's body with this blissful happiness born of mental collectedness. This is yet another visible fruit of the truth-seeking life beyond and more exalted than the previous ones. With the calming of bliss or the calming of joy, stronger joy, doesn't disappear, but it calms down, it gets more mature, easier to maintain. One abides in mental steadiness, present and fully aware, experiencing happiness or ease within one's body, a state which the awakened ones describe steady, present of, steady presence of mind this is a pleasant abiding. One understands and abides in the third level of meditation. And here there's just simply the joy is calming down, the mind is becoming very steady, and we start to realize that steadiness, that upeka, is actually even more blissful than a stronger excited joy. Even though we needed it before to clean the mind, basically, it just soothes the mind. And then the mind doesn't, doesn't need the, the strength of it anymore. It's just really steady. One immerses, permeates, suffuses, and pervades one's body with that happiness beyond joy. And nowhere in one's entire body is left untouched by this happiness beyond joy. Now imagine water lilies, Indian lotuses, and white lotuses. Some of them, some of these water lilies and lotuses are born in the water, grown in the water, not risen above the water, nourished while completely immersed. From their very tip down to their roots, submerged, permeated, suffused and pervaded by this cool water, so that no part of those water lilies and lotuses is left untouched by the cool water. In the same way, one immerses, permeates, suffuses and pervades one's body with that happiness beyond, beyond joy. And nowhere in one's entire body is left untouched by this happiness. This is yet another visible fruit of the truth-seeking life that is beyond and more exalted than the previous ones. Then the fourth level unattached to pleasant sensations and unsteered by unpleasant ones. As mental excitement and heaviness settles, one's mind is balanced, purified by unmoving presence. Does it sound familiar? I know a few of you are experiencing this. One understands and abides in the fourth level of meditation. Then one sits with one's body suffused with the bright purity of one's own spotless mind. 
This is, <laughs> and there's nothing to do here. It's just like, shine. <laughs> yes, and just suffusing the body with that light, basically. And this is here, we're starting, we're talking about the light, light of the Buddha. I started with this. Now we're kind of tying in the loops. And nowhere in one's body is left untouched by the bright purity of one's own spotless mind. Imagine a man was sitting wrapped up to the head with a sparkling white cloth so that nowhere on his entire body would be left untouched by this sparkling white cloth. In the same way one sits with one's body suffused with that bright purity of one's own spotless mind. And nowhere in one's entire body is left untouched by this bright purity of one's own spotless mind. This is yet another visible fruit of the meditative life, beyond this and more exalted than the previous ones. Here, remember, the light is just a metaphor. Because <laughs> a lot of people have been seeing lights and things like that. But uh, <laughs> just remembering that, uh, yeah, the, the light, if the light arises, that's just perceptions. We just six R and we stay with the wholesome object and we stay with that. Um, but this is just a way of talking that the Buddha is using, an analogy, so it's not literal. <laughs> and the, but it's just filling this, like awareness is like the light, basically, and it's just filling the whole body. Now, of course, the Buddha... <laughs> Very confusing. Mm. Hmm? What do you mean? Yes. 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 Yeah, there's no light. That's just a metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't look for a nimitta or something like that. No, no, no. no. <laughs> yes. Well, in all religious, iconic art developments, I don't know, it seems like it's a very common thing uh, to have a halo behind the saints' uh, heads and uh, that are illuminated, basically. Jesus had one. Uh, I mean, all the saints have them. Um, uh, the Buddha seems to have one, too. Um, I mean, we were just talking about the rainbow body today, which is quite cool. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, there's, you know, like some like advanced uh, Tibetan Buddhism practice where they like actually like aim at developing the rainbow body and like their actual human body shrinks into like this kind of like little tiny thing, and then they enter rainbow body and it's just uh, it's caught on camera actually. <laughs> you can see like uh, you can actually see like a rainbow. Body. But that's, I, I have no idea of, about any of this. I'm just saying it. I was, I was mm -hmm. thinking that uh, the light uh, indicates the radiation, radiation uh, the quantity, uh, like mm. uh, yeah. happiness. Yes. 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 Well, there is the th a thing that the Buddha called the light of wisdom. And he said, like, there's four kinds of light in this world. There's the light of the fire, the light of the sun, the light of the moon, and the light of wisdom. And the highest of all of them is the light of wisdom, obviously. And it's true. There is the light of wisdom, and it's actually a light. And it, 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 it's true. Um, but is it shining in a halo kind of thing? Or, you know, not really. But uh, you can see it when people get into these deeper states or when people click, their, the meditation clicks. This is how we actually can tell. Like, their eyes are not moving, they're fully dedicated to their objects, and they're like really wholesome in mind, and they have a halo kind of thing. They have, a, they're bright, yeah, like literally. Mm -hmm. So, um, take it or leave it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
yeah I don't think it's any like uh, if we do a big deal out of it it's not worth it so anyways so and now we're starting to dig into the last fold of the path which is the training in discernment wisdom panya and now he usually he goes over all the psychic abilities and this is another like strength slash weakness of the sutta and I slashed it out of it so <laughs> I mean it's it's it's, it's kind of cool but um, I mean like f people flying in the air going through walls and all of that not, like it's not really selling the teaching in the West anyways I don't know about here but um, yeah usually usually it's just like too much information and it kind of impedes the real content of the stuff that we want to get to uh, so it's really I cut it out completely here and go right to the the asavakaya basically the stilling of all uh, asavas distractions now with this composed and collected mind wholly cleansed and purified clear and open rid of imperfections, having become soft and malleable, straight and unwavering, one directs and inclines one's mind to the complete calming of all mental movements. And sometimes I translate the word uh, asava as distractions to make it more tangible. Sometimes I translate it more as mental movement. Like at the end of a retreat, at the beginning of a retreat, I'll talk about distractions. And at the end of the retreat, I'll talk more about mental movements. Because when you're in the still mind, it's not a full-blown distraction anymore. It's just the... <laughs> the mind is starting to have a beginning of a start of an inclination towards something we don't know yet, but it's going. And then you catch that, basically. You just see how it's like... Oh. <laughs> you're like, not 6R, because 6R is too much too big it's the same principle but it's just happening automatically so it's just a matter of sitting longer just having that process happen by itself so that it becomes autom automated basically and so that's why I call I talk about mental movements here because now we're at the end of the retreat you a lot of people understand this now one understands mental movements as they really are these are mental movements this is the increase of mental movements. This is the release from mental movements. This is how to release the mental movements. Basically, this is the pattern of the Four Noble Truths. One understands mental movements as they really are. This is tension. This is the increase of tension. This is the release of tension. And this is how to release the tension. Again, the Four Noble Truths. Continually observing and understanding in this way, one's mind is released from the inclination for clinging outwardly, from the inclination to projecting in the future, bhava, bhava tanha, from the inclination to negligence. In that release, one knows this is release. One is with the still mind for a few hours, two, three, maybe four hours, maybe five hours. And then this stilling of the mind, the mental movement is become pretty much automated. But we need to stay with it. We need to really actually perfect our discernment to that level that is just, it's gonna be so still that we learn to see the tiniest mental movements at their very root. And then there will be this kind of going into the release of awareness, basically. So now the awareness is fading and dipping down. And this is neither perception or non-perception. And as this is happening, then at some point there will be when somebody stays, usually this is for quite a few hours, there will be a complete dip. And once out of this release, one knows this is release. But it's hard to imagine. <laughs> so this is why this is really amazing because this is really uh, how we can 
understand how this happens. We can think about it, but when it happens, then one comes out, one sees consciousness arising again, then one, if mindfulness is sharp enough, there can be the seeing of how sankharas arise again and create consciousness, grosser and grosser and grosser, until this eye can say, hey, I'm here. And then it looks back, and then it sees that for a while, it was gone, and there was contact with sunyata, voidness. There was, um, it was undirected, and mm, I have a blank. I have a voidness. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's unconditioned, but it's not the it's signless. Yes, there is no object there. There is no not even awareness as an object. So that's pretty uh, pretty profound. So when it comes out of this, the first contacts that arise is these three contacts: voidness, un, uh, signless, and undirected. That's the first thing that one knows, and then there's joy arising because we know that. It's just instantaneous. It's not joy like you know, oh, I've attained Nibbana. It's like actual relief, like deep, deep, deep relief. And the joy will usually be uh, quite good. <laughs> no, <laughs> noticeable, definitely. Yes, yes. Like another analogy is like letting go of the burden, basically. Like the, a burden, a heavy burden has been like lift off your shoulders, basically. And you might be quite giggly <laughs> or very, very happy. Um, and doing this Pachawekana, looking back out of this release, one knows, yeah, this is release. Like, this is, this is it. This is Nibbana. This is the path. And one can be confirmed, basically, through one's own direct experience. And what I'm seeing here doesn't matter. You have to figure it out on your own. You have, to, you have to do it. You have to find it. But I'm just repeating the words of the Buddha. And one, when one knows and sees that very clearly, there's no doubt. There's no more doubt. You see the whole of the path. It's clear. So the rest is just about cultivating that, cultivating that as much as you can. Sometimes causes and conditions will not allow you to go deep in your meditation. That's okay. No problem. Keep it calm. Then work your way through. Continue working on with good sila in your life. That will make a really wholesome base. Then your relationships, everything will work out. It might take a few years. Who knows? It took, it took me a few years, that's for sure. My... my Friends, uh, circles, all change, everything shifted, took many years. And then it happened that, well, I had causes and conditions in my life that supported really good meditation. And at some point it happens. And if it doesn't happen, that's fine. Let, let time just do its thing. It's, it's okay. I thought he was laughing. <laughs> I was like, what's funny? <laughs> so, in that release, one knows this is release. I mean, this could be arahanship too, but it, it's not necessarily arahanship. It's also a confirmation of the path when you experience that. One directly knows unwholesome states have been overcome. <laughs> Usually it's birth, but I like the birth of action, birth of unwholesome states. For that moment, they don't no longer arise. Of course, if you're an arahant, they just it's just done. But you know, there's also a gradual process in this. <laughs> so, lived is the spiritual life. Done is what should be done. There is no more conceit here. This is yet another visible fruit of the truth-seeking life, great King. And in regards to the fruits of the meditative life, there are none beyond or more exalted than this. And so, this is the whole of the path. And the whole of the path is a blessing. The whole of the path is a gift. And it's a gift that we are also offering uh, to others. It's not... Um, 
it's not something active. We're not uh, like actively maybe uh, helping or contributing materially to anything, but the mind is the forerunner of all mental states. Mano pubangamma dhamma, mano sitta, mano maya. So when we purify the mind, like look at this everywhere around you, this was all made by the mind. Of course, the body and tools and all of this, but really it's the mind. The mind is creating all of this. And when the mind is pure and wholesome, it, you don't keep it to yourself. You naturally, you share it with everybody else. When you're angry, when you're impatient, when you're jealous, you also share it with everybody else. That's your gift. But when you choose to cultivate your mind, that's your gift. And so it's a huge contribution and it's not to be overlooked. And this is where we find happiness. This is our refuge. This is where, you know, a lot of people think like, oh, you have to follow all these virtues and you have to like, you know, like kind of, because uh, usually it's called restrain yourself and all that, but you're actually protecting yourself. And this is where we learn to see more and more where we're gonna draw our, our happiness from. It's not our weakness, it, it's our strength, basically. So this whole path is the gift of the Buddha. He's just giving it to us in a glass of light, basically. And we just have to drink it down and practice it and share it without even saying a word. You don't have to even say anything. Just share it with how you are. That's it. No need to say anything. <laughs> and so... Here we are. Once this was spoken, the king Ajatasattu of Magadha exclaimed, Excellent Bhante, excellent. Just as if what had fallen over had been set upright, or as what had been hidden was uncovered, or as if the way was shown to someone who was lost, or as if a light was shown in the darkness thinking, let those with vision see. In the same way, Bhante, the Awakened One has brought forth and elucidated the Dhamma in countless ways. Bhante, I go to the Awakened One as a refuge to the Dhamma and the Bhikkhu Sangha. May the Awakened One count me as a lay follower from now on who has gone for refuge for life. And now I kind of abridged this last section because there's a little bit more, but the King Ajatasattu had uh, committed one of the heinous crimes, so he had killed his father. And the weight that this had on his mind was too heavy for him to see the Dhamma in this particular talk. But this is a talk that was given very often. And the Buddha says, you know, if he hadn't done that, he would have seen the Dhamma because he wouldn't have had that I mean, imagine just doing that, it's crazy, like how much remorse, how much your mind must feel just to do that. So he couldn't actually see and break through. And he said, but if he hadn't, he, the, the vision of the Dhamma would have arisen in him for sure. Um, because it does pretty much every other suttas that this is talked about. <laughs> so, <laughs> and this is like to thousands of people at the same time even. So now you've heard it, <laughs> you've heard the whole of the path and this is really important, this is our practice. This is not just like a, it's not just like a little like a, we're meditating here and now. There's 365 days in the year, a retreat is 10 days. So what you do when you go home, when you practice at home is, it's got a lot more weight in the balance. Of course, retreats are extremely important. There's our like punctuated moments where we have all the really good conditions to practice. But then this is the whole of the path that is really applicable into all of your life, basically. So just from the meditation practice that we've intensively developed here and just to full bloom into this whole path into your life. So I really like how this is laid, laid down. Uh, we really saw everything that was experienced by Upga, basically. We talked about upliftment, the, the mind's been uplifted for <laughs> now eight days. 
and uh, it talks about well we touched upon a little bit on generosity and then the virtues and I love that this is not just it's more elaborated than just like the five or the eight precepts you know it's like actually like there's a little bit more uh, information around it and how how to practice it and and then there's um, you know he doesn't say like it, this is the Eightfold Path, but that's what it is. That's how we usually explained it in this very alive way, basically. Because you can read suttas like the Mahasatipatthana Sutta. At the end, there's like a Vibhanga of the Eightfold Path. Then there's a Vibhanga Sutta also in Sanyutta Nikaya. It's really just like bare information what the Eightfold Path is. But really, the Eightfold Path, that's, that's what it is. That's how we explained it most of the time. And then this is the second sutta, but then the suttas after that, it's just written like repetition. So we don't get to hear that path a lot, but this is it. This is what he taught. The Twelve suttas after that are the same thing. And this is the opening of all of the sutta pitaka, basically, just to put you into context. So this is really important. And so how also, you know, there's like the virtue will support your samadhi. Also, before I thought for myself, I, I didn't understand how the virtue was that much of a big deal if you put your attention on your nostrils. I mean, you're virtuous, right? That's great. <laughs> it's, it's probably going to be easier, but like really, what does it change that much? Like anybody can focus on their nostrils. Like I can focus on that microphone and like somebody that's committed something really not good could do that actually they could be really good at it kind of scary actually <laughs> but in our practice the virtues and a lot of people have been experiencing that too is the virtue is absolutely essential if you have anything inside you can't keep it you have to be fully open and fully genuine because it's not going to arise properly otherwise. Metta won't be okay. And anything there is inside that is hidden, covered, put away, put aside, suppressed, under, it cannot be. It will, you have to be completely open and genuine doing this. And this is where the virtues mean everything in this particular teaching. If you go out there and start doing you know, like all kinds of bad things, Look at the remorse that's going to come up. <laughs> and look at how the mind won't settle down because this practice cannot be done. And this is from another sutta. Cannot be practiced. This kind of samadhi that we're practicing, like Sukhino Chittang Samadhi Ati, cannot be practiced by unvirtuous people. It is impossible. The, the Buddha says that. So the, the virtue here, now, in this practice makes complete sense. It is not... It is not a kind of a side dish of the Eightfold Path. It is part of the main meal. In the Maha Chattari Sakka Sutta, the Majjhima Nikaya, can't remember the number, the exposition of the path, the Buddha starts, how, uh, what is the Samma Samadhi? He says, is the Eightfold Path. That clear. How to, uh, well, he doesn't say it's the Eightfold Path, but he says, it's wise, uh, wise speech, wise action, wise livelihood, wise, uh, wait, <laughs> well, because I have a different, uh, so wise understanding, wise attitude, wise speech, wise action, wise livelihood, and then, why, uh, and then he, wise effort and wise mindfulness, basically wise awareness. And this is how the mind gets samadhi, that this is like this, it's so very clear and the virtue is not separate from that it's actually just the very beginning of everything so and so every section of this path is a reason for happiness is a support for happiness and it's a blameless kind of happiness it's extremely wholesome happiness and the more we learn to see that the more we learn to enjoy the path and we just become more and more devoted and so at the beginning, he says, you know, like uh, there are many professions and all this thing, these things. Uh, he names them, uh, names a few, uh, and there's a kind of a clear delineation, but uh, between uh, having a job and doing all these things and then doing just that meditation thing. But 
there's also an in-between where you can also get a piece of that <laughs> even even at home because then of course this is like you know like the ideal thing and it's very inspiring to look at to lo look up to to look up to okay <laughs> um, and however however much you can integrate of that life into your own life then great do it and then you it's just that much more happiness for you wholesome happiness you don't need anything else and then you can get you can get both worlds basically so um, this is my suggestion to you and I hope that this is helpful in your life coming forward uh, and I think that's all I have to say <laughs> about this path. Uh, I see a few post-its, so maybe is there any questions? Can you, can you see virtue as, for example, if we are looking at objective? Yes. Simple example. Anybody can understand that. Mm -hmm. The right causes of guilt. Yeah, of course. That's the law of karma. So mm -hmm. virtue fits into the right cause of course and mm. for broader aspects. Mm. Like if you're not being the right causes, yes. The right things are not being planned. Mm -hmm. The samadhi is not being planned. Yes, yes. As simple as that. Yes. So if the causes are wrong, yeah. The effects are going to be wrong. Yeah. So if the causes are right, yeah. Obviously the results are going to be mm -hmm. whatever it is. Yes. Like if you try to have a garden on a rock, good luck. <laughs> so, yeah, work with the right causes first and then your garden will grow. Beautiful things. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yes. Yes. Ah. Yes. 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 I can. I can speak. In how many days we have? <laughs> huh? Five minutes. <laughs> so where do I start? <laughs> um, from uh, from my pabaja, basically, or like my going forth, or just life in the forest. Uh, Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, there's so many things, so I'll try to make it nice and uh, package it uh, in a way that it's uh, uh, digestible. <laughs> uh, so basically, um, okay. Well. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I basically, hmm, I've done a lot of things in my life. Um, I've tried a lot of things. Um, I, uh, I felt like I was always looking for something. And where I'm, I was, I'm from in Eastern Canada, Quebec, uh, French side of Canada, um, there's, there's not a lot of examples of, you know, there's, you can't see monks, that's for sure. Uh, Maybe in other places of Canada, you, like English side Canada, you have more chances. French side is definitely less. Uh, we have Vipassana, uh, Vipassana courses, yes, yes, big, big, yeah. But um, I guess things happen in my life. I, I definitely did go through a lot of hard times, which is really classic for monks. I mean, like, even my friends were saying, like, look at you, like, you're a Buddhist monk. Like, <laughs> so. That, that's just like, I, I was definitely a target for that kind of, <laughs> like, look at you, like, you became a Buddhist monk, like, <laughs> like so cliche here, like, so, yeah, there's that component, and yeah, I've been through a lot of, uh, there was a time in my life where, you know, like, I was really lost, I was feeling like I, I, I was missing a whole, uh, like, there was a massive hole in my life, basically, like, what was I doing, I wasn't, I was never really, like, 
somehow attracted by uh, you know anything that I was looking at the, the studying options and I was like I don't want to do any of that <laughs> and then, like I wanted to be a doctor or like something nice like that but it was like so long and so much studying and like I was just like well you know because I, I wanted to do something good but you know it was just like so intense and I was like wow like, I don't know if I want to commit to that and then um, and then I just found I, I just always love nature so um, I started uh, studying adventure tourism so I became like an outdoors guide like guiding people on mountains and uh, climbing yeah ice climbing rock climbing Canoeing. I did long canoe expeditions, guiding people, doing it on my own, like more than one month. In Canada, I did a lot of canoe expeditions in northern Canada. Really beautiful landscape, virgin landscape. Nobody there. Very, uh, very nice. Um, but yeah, uh, I did that for a while, and then um, I was working and. In the silviculture industry, so I was planting trees, so reforesting. So I was kind of trying to do something good, um, but it was just nice because you make a lot of money, and then you're like for three months, and then you're off for the rest of the year. So that's what kind of drew me to that job. <laughs> you can do whatever. I used to surf a lot and uh, do all kinds. I was climbing and all these activities. But uh, I was doing all these extreme activities and, you know, um, really pushing myself to the limit. And at one point, you know, it was like I was gambling with my life a lot, uh, going into really crazy rivers and like I almost died many times. <laughs> uh, so and then, it, and then it became just more and more hollow. It just became more and more like... Um, yeah, and like there's a whole bunch of things around that, but uh, that seeking for happiness and these things all the time, it just gets coarser and coarser, and the next time you just want more and more intense and more, and it's the same thing with everything. And then at some time, I just hit a wall, basically, like a lot of people do, and then really started to question, started a practice of meditation, yoga. I was a yogi for a while. I studied the Bhagavad Gita. I my Bible was the Yoga, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali for a while. Um, I mean, I, I'm just gonna. No, no, no. I was all in America, in Canada and America. I went to some ashrams and uh, yeah, some sang some kirtans and satsang and all that, all of it. Done all of it. Huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I tried a lot of things. Uh, I mean, I've tried like I, uh, energy work, Reiki, and acupuncture, ac acupressure, and uh, background in Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine. You know, I've you can sit here all night, <laughs> uh, and all of this really kind of supported me in many ways. You know, I'm still using all of that baggage in my practice you know I'm still doing asanas in the evening I'm still doing a little bit of my practice it's nothing like I used to I used to do it like twice a day like maybe two or three hours and so um, so <laughs> at some point uh, I was starting meditation and uh, I was trying all kinds of things there's not really a direction to it um, and then one of my friends was going to Goenka's 10-day retreat and yeah, like everybody else, well, my friend was going to Goenka and so I decided to join. And so, um, retreat, Goenka Ji. Yes, Vipassana. How many days? How many days? 10. 10 days. 10 days, yes. Normal, Goenka, normal. And uh, my mind was a mess, like to be honest, my mind was a real mess at that time. It was just like so scattered and I knew, I didn't know about virtues. I mean, I was just living the normal Western life, I guess. It was not like, not like I was a bad person, but just, you know, just, I don't know, just a Western person <laughs> with, with no background and whatever, like good virtues or whatever. So, um, yeah. And then, um, 
yeah, that, that, that really just changed everything for me, like Goenka's teaching. Yeah, it was like a really amazing introduction. Like the virtues, I was just like, wow, like amazing. And that's when I started more the spiritual path, when I talk about the Bhagavad Gita and the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, that's later. Because uh, I still was questing around for, <laughs> for the truth. So, um, but I remember sitting on my bed, uh, it was like day six of the retreat, and I don't know, like there was this like beautiful light through the window coming in, and I'm just like sitting on my bed, like feeling my mind just like, like calm mind basically just and I just never experienced that and I thought like wow like so this is what I want to do with my life really so that it came there day six of my retreat <laughs> but you're in the west and we have no example of that and so I mean yeah that's what I want to do but you know how does it work <laughs> where do I go like where is the I don't know anything about this so the only thing I know is Goenka and so, and so, yeah, this, it just started, I, I kept looking around and it took a few years and then I came upon the Dhammapada and a friend showed me the suttas uh, in uh, a Vipassana center, basically. And when I read the Dhammapada, I was just like, okay, like, this is amazing. Like, this is what I've been looking for, like, everything. And then I just ordered the whole Sutta Pitaka, basically. <laughs> and then I started reading the suttas and I did some research. I didn't know where to start, so I just, I just Google search, you know, uh, where, like, where does it start? <laughs> so I heard the Diga Nikaya was the first book, so I started reading that and I started reading uh, Potapada, the states of consciousness. I went on the table and went, uh, states of consciousness, yeah, this is what I want to read. And then, uh, that was amazing. I was just, uh, and then I read the Samanya Pala Sutta also, which when I read that, this is when I really started to understand more like what the actual Buddha's teaching was. And when I read this, like it just clicked. It was like, yeah, this is, this is it. This is what I want to do. Still, I didn't really know. Uh, there was three people, three young men at the Vipassana Center in Quebec, where I'm from, that we all three, kind of got together there at the same time. We were long-term servers and uh, served there for many months. And um, we were all on our way to ordain, basically. So that was like a kind of a fun, uh, interesting gathering. And I'm still in contact with them. They're kind of all over the place. One's in uh, the UK and the other one's in Canada. And then, yeah, but yet I was still really struggling with my meditation. Uh, when I decided to leave everything, I had a 25-acre plot of land, of forested, forested land uh, in uh, eastern Canada. I, I'd build a tiny house on it by myself, and um, I, just, I just read the suttas, and then I just like, thought, yeah, this is it. Like, I'm, I'm just selling everything. <laughs> and I shaved off. I had really long hair. <laughs> And uh, I just shaved off everything and uh, threw everything in the river. And I just, in my mind, I went forth that time. I was still a lay person, but in my mind, everything changed. And so I started going to Vipassana more. And so I became a long-term server. And um, it was great. Like, I love that tradition. It's beautiful what they're doing. I uh, have nothing really to say against that. Uh, but uh, I have to say that my meditation was terrible. <laughs> um, the, the first dip was really good. It was life changing. But then when I started doing it like more practice uh, a lot, like being there, doing the sit and serve program where I would just serve two or three courses and then sit for one and then do the same thing. Then I was hitting a wall. It was like I was going through like like someone was like strapping uh, a metal bar around my head and here, and I could sit through it. It was disgusting. I was like so much pain and uh, I could just sit through it because I was just being told to remain equanimous and don't get attached to the joy. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was following the instructions and I could sit for a few hours and you know, 
just being so disgusted with the pain that I could shut it off, basically, like a lot of people learned how to do it at that <laughs> in, in this particular thing. And so, but I wasn't feeling like I was awakened. <laughs> I was just feeling like I was called. Actually, that's the insight that got to me. And yeah, one day, uh, my last retreat was because I was reading the suttas, and so I was understanding more and more what the Buddha was saying. And I was like, you know, like I'm not like I'm not cultivating. This is not the end of suffering. <laughs> like <laughs> this is this is anything but <laughs> the end of suffering. <laughs> And then at one point I thought, like, hey, I'm, not, I'm actually cultivating suffering right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, so there was a shift, and I just, like, I stopped. And then I, I didn't tell any of the teachers, and I just started doing just anapana because it felt more calm to me, and I didn't tell anybody. But then it came out, and then they knew, and then they didn't, they didn't like it. And so I just left. And um, so it's good. We're in good terms. I love them still. They're all really good people. But for me, it didn't work. So, <laughs> and so, um, yeah. And then, and then from there, I launched into a massive search of all the teachers there are out there. Like I tried um, retreats online with Ajahn Brahm, with Ajahn Gunarat, uh, Ajahn Bhante Gunaratana, Bhante Ji. Uh, I mean, name them like uh, Saida Utejaniya was interesting also. Um, you know, I was interested in Paok also, the Paok system, because I was reading the suttas and I was like, jhana, 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 and I was like, like, these people are telling me to be scared of jhana, but the Buddha talks about it like almost every sutta, and I'm like, what, like, I mean, can somebody tell me, like, <laughs> what's going on here, <laughs> like, and I was looking for the word vipassana, and funny enough, I couldn't find it, <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, so I was really like wondering what was going on here and the only real tradition that I could find in my complete lack of knowledge in any of that at that point was the Paok yeah and so they really looked like you know for me the virtue that they practiced the sila was really good like I could see like yeah this is probably what the, the monks looked like at the time of the Buddha and that really inspired me first and so I decided to go to Burma, basically. And I had everything booked, like I had my flight ticket and my Kuti reservation. I went to serve uh, Pak Sangha. They came to inaugurate a monastery in southern Georgia. And I, I, they came to Canada too. And I had the opportunity, the opportunity to go serve them for a week. I had, it was either a Satipatthana class at the Vipassana or, or that. And then I thought, well, you know, like, this, we don't get monks around here for <laughs> many often, so I just decided to go serve the Sangha instead. And it was a really good choice. Um, and then anyway, so I won't go too far into that, but, uh, and I met, so I met the, the, the monk in charge of getting uh, res like kutis and people like Western monks registrations in uh, Mamio, basically the northern monastery. And it takes a year to get in. And I was really lucky because I served them. I got in right away. So there was only an eight month period that I had to stay home. And then I was flying there. So I decided to, to do a personal retreat. And um, like I had Paul Xayda's signature on my visa. Like I was set, like my, my flight ticket was booked, everything. And so, Still, my meditation is really terrible, by the way. Like, I'm still, like, this is the main thing. <laughs> still looking for answers. And I, I did ask, you know, Kap Sayadaw's, because it was a very special moment. Like, a lot of the abbots of all the monasteries in Asia flew in to inaugurate the Sima in Georgia, which, because you need a lot of monks to inaugurate the Sima. You can't just, like, be a, a lone monk with, like, no vasa. You, you have to be, like, 10 monks with 10 vasa. And they, you know, and more is better because if somebody has bad virtue or something and they haven't said anything, then the transaction doesn't count. So you flew all these people for nothing to inaugurate a SEMA that doesn't work finally and it's not actually approved. Anyways, Vinaya complications. <laughs> and so, 
so it was really special because they really went all in, like the whole pa, pa Ok Sangha, like all the top abbots and Sayadaws and monasteries just like all flew there. And then I was fortunate enough to like serve them and we went to like Niagara Falls. I, I drove them in my car and all that. So <laughs> it was, it was kind of neat. Um, and there was like 20 of them, 15, 20 of them for sure. And then uh, I asked them, like, because I, I had all these questions, like, why does the Buddha says this in the Anapanasati? Like, why does he say, like, being aware of the whole body? And then there's a bracket that says, of breath. And it's like, well, where does that come from? And he's like, and they were just answering me with the commentaries and really, you know, I asked a question, but how they answered were like, with like 20 more questions. So it wasn't answering my question, really. It was just making it more complicated. And then they would just straight up tell me, you know, like, well, you're a lay person. You can't understand this. <laughs> like, like, I mean, like, that's, that's how it's understood, you know. Like, in generally, you know, it's so far deep in. Like, people have to study their lives. You know, they study the, the actual early texts. Then they study the commentaries. Then the sub-commentaries. Then the Visuddhi Magga. And then all, like, the exegetical uh, works around that and so yeah that I'm sorry that didn't answer my questions so um, so I kept searching then I did the retreat with Bhante Gunaratana and I was starting my eight-month retreat by myself and my mom's place uh, in Quebec and so I was barely done that um, yeah, I was barely done my Bhanteji retreat online with, like, he uses metta for absorption jhana. And then uh, before that was Ajahn Brahm. Uh, and what was absorption uh, for metta and as well as meditation? Yes. Well, basically, it's very well described in the Visuddhi Manga. <laughs> if you want to know more about it, it's basically using a one, like, a one person, but it, it just really like instead of opening up like we do because we use the one person for example but that's like to tr to help us to like it's like using a wholesome object to help us trigger the metta and then we open it up basically we don't uh, but the absorption is just like kind of diving into the one uh, the feeling basically and it's like a one pointed thing or, or, or a one person object but um, actually, Bhante Gunaratana was influenced by Bhante Vimal Ramsey a long, long time ago. When Bhante Vimal Ramsey first arrived in America, he went to Bhavana Society because there was not a lot of choices at that time, <laughs> like 30 years ago. So he went to Bhavana Society and he was actually known as Bhante V. <laughs> so, funny fact. And he would. There's, a, there's actually a really old video of Bhante Ji and Bhante Vima Ramsey, and they're like young. <laughs> and they're like, they're like, you're like giving a talk together, and Bhante Vima Ramsey is like talking about like people are like putting too much like intensity and mindfulness and, absor and like absorption and things like that, and he's like starting to talk about this more like open approach, and Bhante Gunaratana is like, Yes, but, <laughs> and then it's just like, but absorption, like, as it is said, so he goes into the whole con concentration practice, and so, um, yeah, so there's just uh, funny, like, I mean, there's so many things to say and about Bhante. I was a huge fan of Bhante Vimal Ramsey in the first, in the very beginning, I just, like, I listened to all of his talks, like, many times on YouTube, there's, like, there's a lot. <laughs> And uh, like kind of get, got to learn all the stories and, and then went there to spend basically a whole summer there and uh, attend on him. And yeah, so I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm kind of like trying to move forward. <laughs> yes, well, there, they, there's, there's a lot of time in between this, but I'm not going to. I mean, there's, I'm trying to get to the core so that I'm, I'm getting to the point where I, like my, because I'd just been serving at the, the, mon, the new monastery in Georgia too in Park, so I didn't talk about that, but I went there and I flew and I served there for a while and I got to serve Sayadaw there. And, um, 
and really get a, you know, that's what, that's what happens when you want to become a monk. You will serve at the monastery and you go get a feel for it. You know, it just not, doesn't, doesn't happen like, uh, so that's what I learned in my complete ignorance of all of this. That's how I learned as just, I'll just go serve at the monastery. And so um, I was cooking and it was like all Chinese sponsored, like you know, the Paok is all Chinese sponsored. And it was just like, I was, I'm, I'm kind of a cook in the past, but I was just like, <laughs> it was all written in Chinese. <laughs> and like, all these things, I had no idea what it was. So it was interesting. <laughs> But, um, and then I went to my, uh, started my eight, mo eight months retreat. My practice was still terrible, even though, you know, I was learning more of the path, which was quite nice. But, um, and then slowly it was going like Ajahn Brahm. I really liked his approach about like starting a retreat, like relax, you know, like don't try to dive in into like crazy, you know, like uh, uh, absorption right away. Like if you're tired, like take a break, you know, like there's a transition that needs to happen. You, and I really love that. He was really good at that. And then Bhanteji started to like implement metta in, again, absorption, but it was at least metta, which was kind of nice. And it, it, and it, he says, and I think it's true, it, it actually is much faster to, to attain these things because the mind is just really wholesome and that helps. Um, but then it, yeah, but then it really, in the end, it really didn't work <laughs> for me anyways. I was having the same problems and still practicing Anapana. But then first what I felt like the straps around my head, it started again when cultivating Anapana. So I was just like, okay, it's like, there's something like I'm not, I'm just not working. <laughs> it's just not working. And so... My friend, which, with who I served the Georgia Center, she said, hey, you should try uh, TWIM. They have free online retreats, and my friend had really good experience with them. So I'm like, sure, I'm just trying everything now. Like, online retreat, yeah. But they didn't have room for me yet, so they, it was only in a month. And I guess I'm that kind of person, I didn't want to wait. So I just went, I booked the one in a month, and then I saw, well, the videos are on YouTube, so I'm just going to do it anyways. <laughs> and I read the books, and I, and I saw that on the website there was like a few help pages, so I read that, like I know them almost by heart. And uh, <laughs> so um, I started doing that. My, we can't really talk about meditation, monks, but um, I can just say that my meditation went deeper in 10 days than it did in five years before that with everything that I tried. So obviously, needless to say, I was pretty impressed. And that was without a teacher yet. That was just by myself. I was just like, wow, this is amazing. Like all my problems in meditation were just like completely gone. It, it turned my whole meditation around. And it basically, I started listening to Bhante Vim Laurence's teachings online, I wasn't actually done my Bhante Ji retreat yet, but I was just curious. So I just started listening to his talks and I was just like, this monk is like literally answering all of my question one after the other exactly the way that I thought it worked and he's just confirming it. And so I had a lot of faith arising in Bhante like right away. And then I did the first retreat by myself, and then, uh, and then I, after that, I just flowed into my actual booked retreat with a teacher <laughs> online, and uh, it was Prashant Billmore. I'm not sure if he's still uh, teaching. Prashant, yeah. Prashant Billmore. He's in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was really good. He was, and his teacher was also uh, Doug Kraft. And Doug, yeah, he's from the Easing Awake Sangha, basically. Doug Kraft is his teacher. And he never met Bhante Vimaramsi, actually. But he has really beautiful approach, beautiful understanding. And poor him, I mean. At that time, no. At that time, no. I don't know if he did eventually, but yeah. I think, and that, I think that's what I remember, yes. Because a lot of people, you know, they've never met Bhante, even though they're teachers, you know, that's, that's quite, uh, yeah, yeah. No, not everybody's been to Missouri, actually, just a few, not that many people. 
most of the Twim Sangha in the U.S. is not in Missouri. It's in California, in the Bay Area. And this is where uh, Delson and I will be uh, in the Easter retreat, basically, uh, in April. Delson might not be there, but hopefully he can be there. Uh, he was there last year. And uh, so that, that's been happening every year almost for a long, long time. That was like Bante's kind of retreat, the Easter retreat. It was in Joshua Tree for a long time, and then it moved to, uh, to uh, San Juan Batista. Um, so, yeah, poor Prashant. I mean, I wrote him like a 10-page email. <laughs> Just like describing, so this is what happened. <laughs> and uh, he was really kind and he was really helpful and he just said, okay, just let's start from the beginning again. <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> So I know, I know how it feels. <laughs> I know very much how it feels. Huh? Start from the beginning. Yeah, start from the beginning. Like whatever you experienced, like, because it, it wasn't guided. Like this meditation has to go through specific stages. We have to make sure that some states are like actually settled and you go through at least some of the, the, the gateways that we use because then sometimes, you know, people will move away from them and then it's not going to be the same meditation. Like people will go into like, for example, too much equanimity at first and then leaving the joy will not lead to the same sharpness of mind. It won't go as deep and then people get into like a kind of, a, we call it like a half jhana basically where it's not the same thing. So we have to make sure that some gates are being gone through. It's not always exactly perfectly the same, but some, some are essential. And so, we, yeah, so we did that process. And uh, well, after that, obviously, like I, I just wrote to David and uh, said, well, I want to become a monk for the rest of my life. Can I come? <laughs> and he's like, sure. Because, um, I mean, a lot of people went there anyways. And uh, so, uh, so I canceled my flight ticket, my Kuti reservation. I was, wasn't going to Burma anymore. That was done, like I'm happily done with it. I was like, well, I wanted to go to Asia because I thought this was more where the real Dhamma was, that my understanding of it was like that. And I still kind of think that being a monk in the West is not the same thing. <laughs> it's very different. It's possible, but it's not the same thing. So I still had that idea, but I, you know, I let it go. And I was like, you know, the real Dhamma is more important. <laughs> so I'll just go to Missouri which I never would have ever imagined that Missouri had the Saddhamma, you know? <laughs> anyway, so what a place to uh, never imagine. But there it is. And uh, I went. I mean, I did my eight-month retreat. I spent four months just basically doing twin retreats. Uh, I did a, yeah, I did like back-to-back -back all the retreats that was available on YouTube, like all, no stop just that's it that's all I was doing and then at some point I was like okay I'm getting it now and then I just was I got my own rhythm through the you know when you do an eight month retreat it's like you, you, you develop your own rhythm through it and then uh, I would basically um, I would wake up in the morning I'm a morning meditator I love to meditate in the morning I'm fresh I'm light I didn't eat my mind is clear so I do a long long sit in the morning and fly through until and I've been eating one meal a day for a long time now, many years. So that was just natural. Um, and then I would come down and then cook for my mom if she was there, which I love doing. It was like my dana, basically. And uh, she doesn't like cooking, so she was really happy and it made me happy. And so it was great for my practice. <laughs> so you can do great things at home, actually, like especially nowadays, you know, there's, there's a lot of freedom you can have if you're smart about the way that you manage your life. So I, it was great. Like I never actually had that much, that good of a retreat afterwards. Like, it, sorry, I'm a monk. <laughs> like, <laughs> like other amazing things have happened. But I mean, in terms of retreat, like it was just great. There was like all conditions were lined up and it was great. So 
And then I practiced that for a long time, and then I listened to pretty much all of Dante's talk at least two or three times. That's not counting the ones that I listened like 12 times, like the Anupada Sutta and things like that. So, <laughs> guilty. <laughs> and then obviously when I arrived at Damasuka, I pretty much knew everything that you know was to be known for two <laughs> So I was already like... And then meeting Bhante, and then meeting the whole Sangha there. I met a lot of people would fly in, so I met a lot of the Sangha. And um, I started uh, attending on their interviews for a long time, for many months. I swept Bhante's porch and put it in his chair and put water in his water fountain of the Buddha and uh, with the Yoda on top. He's got a Yoda figurine with the, with the lightsaber. And pe when people say, okay, I'll try, he says, there is no try. <laughs> you either do it or you don't. <laughs> and he points to the Yoda. Because <laughs> that's, uh, I guess this is American culture, but. <laughs> so this is very, uh, this is, yeah, the running gag of uh, Damasuka. And um, there's so many things around that. I mean, there's so many stories around that. I mean, I was. I was doing so many things there, uh, uh, yeah, and it was great, a uh, wonderful place, um, though then uh, Bhante, uh, Bhante was traveling to Asia and back and forth to America, so I couldn't really stay there, um, like it's not really set up long term for monastics there, so I had to leave and uh, find a place to stay for the winter. And so I went to Canada, and uh, there was many options, but I just decided to go to Canada. And um, I went to a place where I'd been before, where I thought, well, if it's going to work somewhere, it's probably there. And it's uh, in British Columbia on the west coast. It's beautiful mountain, beautiful, pristine lakes, and uh, really a special place. Uh, so I decided to go there. There was a retreat center that hosted me way up in the mountain. Three, kilom three kilometers up the mountain. My, there's no support, no TWIM community there, like zero, nothing, bindu. And Singala has <laughs> bindu is zero. <laughs> and uh, so it was like starting from scratch, like really um, trying to go for alms, Pindapat. Uh, my Pindapat was six kilometers just to go to town. And <laughs> I got there in the fall, so the winter was starting to, it was getting cold. And so, you know, uh, going for alms and um, not, it was, wasn't working. <laughs> People thought I was wearing costume. I like, they were, they were saying, like, hey, you brought your drum. <laughs> it's like thinking I had a, a drum. So uh, my bowl was just like, it's so even less thinking of putting food in it. And the most common thought would be money, but I don't handle money. And I haven't been since I papaja, basically since I was a salmonera. Uh, so the, but the Buddha was very clear on that. And unfortunately nowadays there's, you know, there's maybe like less than 1% of all monks that uh, do not handle money. Yeah, so. Uh, so it's not easy, you know, like uh, you don't have the resources. Uh, and it's, it's so many funny things happen. I, I mean, I have so many stories about my stay in Canada. Um, yeah, going for alms and, uh, you know, people, is, they're like, what's going on with this person? You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> so who's that guy wearing these robes or whatever it is? Like, uh, well, I said, like, uh, I love your costume, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I got that quite a few times. Um, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, it wasn't working for alms that well. Like, sometimes there would be, like, this, like, person who would click, you know, they'd be like, hey, like, do you need something? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm going for alms. This is how I live. This is how I survive. I just accept food that's being put in my bowl, basically. And so some of them would pick up and they would go into a store and put some food in my bowl. And I figured the mornings wouldn't be good like because uh, everybody's rushing to work with their coffees and things like that. So they're not really in a mindset to 
like, oh, you're a monk, that's so nice. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> so more, I was aiming more for like the 11 kind of uh, time where hopefully some people would like be around town. And so I was going down the main strip. Mainly my goal was to just like act presence there, like go walk down once. And then I was, uh, some really kind person gave me the, opening hours for all the free food banks <laughs> in town. <laughs> and that was like really golden. Uh, basically, I went to the free food banks for many months. I even some days, the free food banks were not open, like Salvation Army or whatever like it was. Uh, and there was like a free bread shelf uh, in the lobby there and you know like I was just like a homeless person basically with every all other homeless people so I got a real deep uh, insight about the real homelessness like the real homeless side of what we're doing really uh, I definitely had uh, my ego checked a lot of times <laughs> like pretty bad <laughs> like <laughs> going walking for six kilometers and hey it's family day nothing's open you're not gonna eat today bud <laughs> and you're gonna have to walk back your mountain <laughs> and so um, that was really insightful and uh, really you know and like the past date white hamburger buns in the freed bread shelf was like gold to me because I could actually eat that day so that's what it meant to me and um, but so many amazing things happened too like I know all of the homeless people in that town uh, I've been with them I've eaten with them I like uh, I mean I know their stories they're just gonna like, and they're so colorful people like they have all kinds of stuff going on and you're just like okay like this is happening and and you know really touching things happen too like they would come to me and like out of the blue like I've seen them a few times and it's like you know like I'm never gonna forget forget you like and really like well that's like yeah like so beautiful like their kindness and uh, actually you know some homeless people they would they didn't have anything they're like on leaning against a brick wall like in a corner somewhere and he'd say like hey man like here I have my bread <laughs> and I was like oh this is so nice like yeah they have nothing and they don't care like it's just like hey man like eat <laughs> and I ate that day because of that one person who didn't have anything anyways so many stories that you know like I taught I taught at homeless shelters too like uh, just metta, they can't do much, you know, some of them, a lot of them have like really deep uh, mental disorders, so, and you don't know what it is, and you don't know how they're going to be, like, mm -hmm. but doing the metta for some time did help them, and it was nice just to offer them that. Uh, so, this is really the beginning, then it picked up, <laughs> then the people, I got hooked to a lot of, like a community a little bit more, and we figured out, okay, we need a schedule, because I can't just do that, this is like too insecure kind of thing, like, uh, like I never know if I'm going to eat, and, um, and then people, we started to find that um, once a week, somebody could like take a day, and I'll just go there, even though it's far, I'm just going to walk there, and then uh, have a meal there and they would invite me and they would say like okay every Wednesday you come to my place and then I, I would have some holes still that I would fill in with like and by the way these uh, these free food banks are mostly uh, Catholic so um, it was really interesting <laughs> they see this Buddhist monk who's like coming in and has got no money got like I have to eat food that is offered to me that day. I can't keep food. Uh, so um, really interesting interactions, but uh, really it was like a really good, you know, uh, opening for like interfaith kind of uh, respect. And it was really nice to, and that's where I say my ego was really like complete, because I mean, I wanted to eat like, I mean, of course you want to eat like that one meal, you know, <laughs> so, so, and then like, um, 
and you know like I'm not a huge coffee drinker but even like I would get like to the like that free coffee thing and I was just like that was gold to me it was like because I'm not saying like this was winter too <laughs> like, <laughs> like there's a foot of snow on the ground and I'm leaving my kuti on top of the mountain and like I'm shoveling my deck and there's like this much snow on my roof and on my deck and uh, I'm wearing like three layers of robe and uh, wool under and everything and uh, I'm going down with my full-on mountain boots and crampons down the mountain <laughs> And uh, so it's pretty extreme. <laughs> um, and oftentimes I would just be completely drenched, like completely soaked, back up, going back up the mountain. But then more support started to happen. People asked like more about teaching and I started teaching at a yoga studio in town. Every Wednesday I went there, I walked down uh, six kilometer again because I did that for Findapat first, so that was like 12 kilometers times two, just so you know. <laughs> I was quite fit. <laughs> and then, um, but it was great. It was like really living, at, like a, it was, it said in the, the Buddhas, like in the suttas, I would climb back up the mountain and there was like this like trail and I would go there and I would just like sit down on my return, return from alms round. Uh, under a tree on top of a rock and I would just like meditate with the whole like mountains in front of me and I mean that was also priceless uh, it wasn't easy but these moments were really golden um, so yeah winter and then alms and then slowly it picked up and then teaching and then people started to catch like really like the metta that's what metta does <laughs> and the six R's how it goes deeper. Then we started, um, then COVID happened. <laughs> then couldn't go out, couldn't go for pin the pot. Then it got a little tricky. Uh, fortunately, somebody offered me a, a really uh, virtuous couple, offered me to, that I come to their place and they were gonna take care of everything for me. So that was nice because I couldn't stay at the retreat center. They also had a lot of their family members coming in and you know, they couldn't feed me and they, it was just too much. And so I decided to move there and that's still where I am today when I'm in Canada. That's where the Kuti is, that's where the Heart Dhamma is, the Heartwood Hermitage, the, that tiny house Kuti. And then, so basically this Kuti was offered uh, people Kind of bought it it's not paid for but it's it's at least somewhere i can live in and it's it's in a pretty good place it, it's not perfect i'm a little too far now to go for alms in town i don't have access to the support that i used to be able to tap in like the free food banks it's like 10 kilometers now so it's just a little too much <laughs> sometimes i would go to the farmer's market and go for alms because I figured it's kind of like the same kind of mindset people they're like you know go to the farmers market and it's kind of you know mindful people and uh, in Nelson in general it's really good people though um, but it's 10 kilometers so it's 20 kilometers there and back so I need a ride <laughs> and the bus schedule isn't great so I can't really do the bus thing so I'm kind of stuck in a way because but it's a good stock, so I can't really go to town easily. And now I have a lot of rules around, you know, I can't, I can't be alone with a woman, basically. Like, I can't be alone in a car with a woman. So these are all, like, tricky things. And one of my major support there is a woman. So there's a lot of things I can't do. But it's working, you know. Now there's a community that grew around that. And we have Sunday talks, as maybe you've seen. Um, and then uh, more and more we've had retreats and now there's been a little bit of interest. Of course, COVID's been really hard on our community. It divided a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, because, I mean, it was really, yeah, I think it happened for everybody, but uh, yeah. And then, uh, well, yeah, I was still a Salmon era, so I still wanted full ordination, Upasampada, and I was looking for any, anywhere I could do that. And uh, it was supposed to be at Mahabodhi Society for a long time, but it was COVID, everything was shut down. 
Then at some point after a year, a year and a half, I just like went, okay, like India's no, not opening up right now. <laughs> like it's not happening. And I knew that Sri Lanka was open. And then I heard about this monk, Nyanadipa Bhante. He's like a Denmark Bhante. He's known as, uh, he spent like 40 years in the forest in Sri Lanka and he just passed away a couple of years ago. And he was really famous for not being famous. <laughs> for just being a completely like all in forest person. Like he would just like, go in the forest and study the suttas and I was I read about his story and I was really inspired and the monastery where I am now is the monastery where he ended his life basically he decided to go there because it's in uh, it's in Tanjantena it's uh, it's not really well known it's in Balanguda Balanguda so there's uh, like uh, two kind of well there's a lot of forest traditions in Sri Lanka related to Galdua but um, so basically, there's uh, like the the main bulk of the like the kind of the real forest monks, if you can say that, is around the Lagala forest kind of uh, knuckles range in the, that the, those mountains there. That's where like you know people just live like at the time of the Buddha. They go for alms. There's no monastery really. They just go to the village for alms, then they go in the forest, and that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so there's two communities, two main communities where there's that kind of attitude, where there's not a huge, like, monastery center base, where it's mostly putties all over the place in the forest. And there's, like, my monastery is a little bit more centralized. It's like a resting place for, like, all the forest monks. We have, like, a... From now? You're going to stay in Sri Lanka? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> well, um, everything is changing, as you noticed. <laughs> Anicca. Uh, I do love that community there, yes. It's a really, really good monks. Really, uh, really lovely Sangha. It's nearby. Hmm? Lagala is nearby. Yes. And our, our monastery too, Tenna, is like known to be like yeah like free forest monks we just yeah there's like monks dedicated to forest practice basically and that's kind of rare nowadays it's yeah well i mean i i built a kuti in the forest so that took a few months <laughs> by myself so it's like a lot of hauling materials and yeah that, that was and then I had to study in Sri Kalyana Yoga Shrama, Kalyani Yoga Shrama, the tradition I'm in, from a Galdua tradition. Um, there's an exam, you have to study Vinaya quite, quite a lot. Like in places like Nauyana, yeah, you remember that. <laughs> yes. You were second in Sri Lanka. Oh, very good. Oh, yes. In that batch, huh? Not a lot of. Not a whole lot of material to study from, yeah. So they get like a one-year course usually, but in my in my monastery it's really free. Like there's not a whole, there's no schedule. There's no bell in the morning. You wake up and you go like do puja or like there's it's like everybody's free basically. That's why a lot of like the monks, the forest monks, like it there because they can just do their own practice. Hmm. Alms, yeah. Well, it was more alms center before. Now there's a big dana sala. So a lot of the monks are starting to be more settled. But the thing is that the history of that particular place was uh, that it was always a resting place uh, for forest monks. And it was called the Gilanhala, basically uh, the infirmary. So that's, it was just a place that forest monks would come just to get medical requisites or treatments and things like that. They would rest and then they would go back to the forest. We have like a driver that's like a three-wheel three -wheel driver that's just basically, that's his job. He's just driving monks around to their kutis in the forest. Like some are like 20, 30, 40 kilometers away. And so, but it has remained in that spirit, basically. So some monks, you know, we don't see for three, four, five months. And uh, 
They come in once in a while and say, oh, Bhante, <laughs> you're still alive. <laughs> and, then, um, and then we have like oh, these people that, um, you know, that it's like, oh yeah, this Bhante, do you know them? Do you know this German Bhante? Or like, I don't know, like this, this Bhante from Denmark or whatever. And he's like, yeah, we haven't seen him for four years, but... He's still alive out there. <laughs> He's still like practicing out there. So, and I just thought like yeah, it's like we in Twim we don't have a monastic core. And uh, personally, well, that's one of my long-term goals uh, to kind of uh, maybe have a chance to have that basically. But to for us to ordain, it's not easy because we have to go in another tradition and you know what that means so the whole understanding of Buddhist teaching is different but in this particular monast monastery is really good because it's free and I could basically like do my own thing without creating waves because a lot of the monasteries they won't they won't allow you like yeah, yeah there's no way. no way so anyways there's and some like SBS or like some like the Thai forests are pretty much the same, but SBS is a bit more open, and that's a monastery in Malaysia. Um, they will allow people to actually, you know, go and visit other teachers and things like that. So it's it's not impossible, but it's very very few. And I had like I researched that for like years, literally. So, and this was like my best option. I thought. Um, Sorry? Well, what do we need for that is, well, I mean, uh, we need a Sangha. Monks need support. Uh, we, need, uh, we need to uphold good Vinaya. Uh, then we need, uh, we need a monastic place. Because uh, lay, lay and monks cannot live like together, really. We can live together on the same patch of land. But uh, we have to be, we have to be, usually there's a monastic section. We have to keep things separate. We have to educate, you know, uh, bring more awareness what this means, what is Vinaya, uh, and why it's important to uphold. And then, um, but then there's such beautiful uh, potential I, I see. And there's a lot of people that are becoming monks right now that are actually really interested in TWIM. And so there's, a, there's quite a bright horizon, to be honest, but it's just, it's beginning and it's, it's not easy. It's not, it's not always easy. And so, yeah, and I've told many people, you know, like if I can help, like they want to ordain or something, if I can help, I will. I told Delson that, I told uh, Metananda the same thing. Uh, but yeah, it's not easy. I mean, like in, in that school, we have to study Vinaya. So I, I did that. They usually give you a, a one-year course. I had a few months, and I was by myself. I just studied it like crazy. And uh, <laughs> nobody, said. Uh -huh. nobody said preceptor. Preceptor. Yes, I have a preceptor. Well, the the way that it works in Galdua is that, uh, and that's quite common in nowadays, is that they have mass ordinations. So we like we were a hundred monks this year, last year, to ordain. Yeah. Yeah, it was the water sima. Yeah, floating sima. <laughs> Just boated boated across a hundred monks, <laughs> batch of four at a time. And just waiting and actually in that tradition they're really like they really want to preserve the pristine vinya and so they do the transaction three times just to make sure it's and it's already a long <laughs> transaction just one because if a, if one monk has bad virtue they have an offense they haven't confessed or they have a parajika or a sangha disesa or whatever they're not clean uh, the whole thing doesn't work like you're not actually ordained e even if you know even if they did the motion and all of that so they do they have three groups of three different monks that are 10 years in the robe plus usually much more and then they like uh, and then they usually have like 10 or 12 monks per group 
And then we all sit in the chair and we all sit, like I said earlier, like really close because we have to be within Hatha Pasta, basically. And we really don't want to mess it up. So we're like on their knees, basically, with our robe and bowl and just like repeating the Pali. And, uh, and then it happens three times. <laughs> and then they're like saying the whole motion and then they all leave, they switch and then the whole other group comes and uh, <laughs> yes, yes. It was like really long. <laughs> and you're on this water sima that is just like floating in the middle of the lake because that's part of the vinya. It's either like a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like it's not accessible to other. Yeah. Anyways, there's all kinds of things around that. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, well, so that's, that's what it is. And now uh, Sri Lanka, and uh, I don't know where this is going. I just arrived here and uh, taught with Delson at the Bodh Gaya retreat and I'm just seeing like the Sangha in India and I knew the Sangha in America and my Sangha in Canada and uh, but I, I thought there was something going on in India but not, I didn't think it was that big, yeah, really not, I didn't think it was much happening but now I see this and I'm, I'm in the wow phase, it's great, I'm really happy to, to see all these dedicated people, it's really beautiful to see. And yeah, like I'm talking to Madhusudan and he's telling me that we want to do retreats every month, basically, and I'm thinking, this is like, <laughs> this is happening now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I think India is uh, probably going to pull me in, so <laughs> for a little bit anyways. Uh, so yeah, who knows? And then I'm flying to I'm flying to the Bay Area in California in April. So uh, and then there's all kinds of things happening. And then I'm going to Canada, and then maybe Sri Lanka, and then India. I don't know. I don't. Stay tuned. <laughs> I have no idea what's gonna happen. But, uh, yes. 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 Oh uh, well. Yes. Hmm. Viposata? Yeah, so basically I, uh, I would have to observe it myself. But there's not much you do, like you just prepare water for washing the feet and say, this is Viposata today. I determined Viposata. <laughs> That's about it. Yes, yes. I talked to him uh, uh, after the Bodh Gaya retreat. Um, I mean, it's hard for them to understand. They don't know. They don't know anything about me, basically. Yeah. I. I uh, but they're doing well. Uh, they're really just kind monks, and I, I love the whole sangha there. They're really good, good monks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that's the journey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so much more, but I mean, that's it. Yeah, that's 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 a good. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, at that point, in every community is different, and one of our major guidelines is, you know, preserving harmony. And so whenever we're in a community, even though we don't agree necessarily with everything that they're doing, we just kind of, you know, when, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, basically. Uh, <laughs> you don't make a mess, unless it's like really like crazy, but then you just leave, you know, like if it's really like too much. But although I have to say that I saw the benefit of Vinaya in many ways where in that particular monastery, we're a really colorful bunch. Like, we all come from really different backgrounds, and we all end up there because it's for the same reason, because it's free, and we can have our own practice, so it makes us very kind of different. But the, the one thing that keeps us together, that we all agree upon, is maintaining Vinaya, and that keeps us together. And within the Vinaya, there's rules about being like respectful to each other. Uh, if there's a motion put, you don't criticize it. 
that's against the rules. Like if, if it's been put, like everybody's agreed on it, you don't bring it back up again, that's it. And that's interesting, but it really does work for communal harmony. It helps people move on, you know, and not bring up, like uh, dig up the dead again, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> and there's so many things in the Vinaya that like really condu are conducive for harmony. And when we uphold this, at least we can live together, even though we're all different in our practice. So actually the Vinaya is a really beautiful thing when it's seen like that, so. And you know, just being, uh, I came from Canada and I flew into Sri Lanka and I landed at the monastery and in Canada, you know, there's, you know, it's good, but there's not a, a big understanding of monastic, you know, life and things like that. There's very, very small support still. Uh, I arri arrived at the monastery and, you know, you could feel it right away as a monk or anybody who's practicing, like, there's something in the air that's like, because of the Vinaya, it's really conducive to the practice. Yeah, really conducive. And it's like day and night. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, that was a part of the journey. And now I'm here talking to you. And uh, I haven't even touched one of the post-its yet. <laughs> <laughs> so what should we do? I leave it up to you. I mean, it's, it's getting late. So I, I totally understand that we can move on then. Ah, uh, well, yeah. Yeah, ooh. Yes, let's do it tomorrow, yes. That's what I thought yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what happens. <laughs> yes, very good. Okay, let's share our merits, and then, then that's it. We'll just do it in English. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired, for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Have a beautiful evening. Vittayam chankumaikaraja Avisavanno patavimbhaso Tang tang namasami harisavanna patavimbhaasam Dhyanja Gudnta Vihare Murati Him Brahmena Veda Gusabhadhami Devi Namo Tejamam Palayantu Namadntu Buddhana Sopari so